the Duke of Tarentum, or MacDonald, as his old comrades preferred to call him, was, as I could perceive, in the vilest of tempers. His grim, Scotch face was like one of those grotesque donokers which one sees in the Fauborosti Germain. We heard afterwards that the Emperor had said in jest that he would have sent him against Wellington in the south, but that he was afraid to trust him within the sound of the pipes. Major Charpentier and I could plainly see that he was smouldering with anger. Brigadier Gerard of the Hussars, said he, with the air of the corporal with the recruit. I saluted. Major Charpentier of the Horse Grenadiers. My companion answered to his name. The Emperor has a mission for you. Without more ado he flung open the door and announced us. I have seen Napoleon ten times on horseback to once on foot, and I think that he does wisely to show himself to the troops in this fashion, for he cuts a very good figure in the saddle. As we saw him now, he was the shortest man out of six by a good hand's breadth, and yet I'm no very big man myself, though I ride quite heavy enough for a hussar. It is evident, too, that his body is too long for his legs. With his big, round head, his curved shoulders, and his clean-shaven face, he is more like a professor at the Sorbonne than the first soldier in France. Every man to his taste, but it seems to me that, if I could clap a pair of fine light cavalry whiskers, like my own, on to him, it would do him no harm. He has a firm mouth, however, and his eyes are remarkable. I have seen them once turned on me in anger, and I had rather ride at a square on a spent horse than face them again. I am not a man who is easily daunted, either. He was standing at the side of the room, away from the window, looking up at a great map of the country which was hung upon the wall. Berthier stood beside him, trying to look wise, and just as we entered, Napoleon snatched his sword impatiently from him and pointed with it on the map. He was talking fast and low, but I heard him say, the valley of the Meuse, and twice he repeated Berlin. As we entered, his aide-de-camp advanced to us but the emperor stopped him and beckoned us to his side. You have not yet received the cross of honor, Brigadier Gerard? he asked. I replied that I had not, and was about to add that it was not for want of having deserved it, when he cut me short in his decided fashion. And you, Major? he asked. No, sire. Then you shall both have your opportunity now. He led us to the great map upon the wall and placed the tip of Berthai's sword on dreams. I will be frank with you, gentlemen, as with two comrades. You have both been with me since Mahingo, I believe. He had a strangely pleasant smile, which used to light up his pale face with a kind of cold sunshine. Here at Reims are our present headquarters on this the 14th of March. Very good. Here is Paris, distant by road a good 25 leagues. 
Blacher lies to the north, Schwarzenberg to the south. He prodded at the map with the sword as he spoke. Now, said he, the further into the country these people march, the more completely I shall crush them. They are about to advance upon Paris. Very good. Let them do so. My brother, the King of Spain, will be there with a hundred thousand men. It is to him that I send you. You will hand him this letter, a copy of which I confide to each of you. It is to tell him that I am coming at once, in two days' time, with every man and horse and gun to his relief. I must give them forty-eight hours to recover. Then straight to Paris. You understand me, gentlemen. Ah, if I could tell you the glow of pride which it gave me to be taken into the great man's confidence in this way. As he handed our letters to us I clicked my spurs and threw out my chest, smiling and nodding to let him know that I saw what he would be after. He smiled also, and rested his hand for a moment upon the cape of my dolman. I would have given half my arrears of pay if my mother could have seen me at that instant. I will show you your route, said he, turning back to the map. Your orders are to ride together as far as Bazookis. You will then separate, the one making for Paris by Ulchi and Nelly, and the other to the north by Brain, Soissons, and Senlis. Have you anything to say, Brigadier Gerard? I am a rough soldier, but I have words and ideas. I had begun to speak about glory and the peril of France when he cut me short. And you, Major Charpentier? If we find our route unsafe, are we at liberty to choose another? said he. Soldiers do not choose, they obey. He inclined his head to show that we were dismissed and turned round to Berthia. I do not know what he said, but I heard them both laughing. Well, as you may think, we lost little time in getting upon our way. In half an hour we were riding down the high street of Reims, and it struck twelve o'clock as we passed the cathedral. I had my little grey mare, Violet, the one which Sebastiani had wished to buy after Dresden. It is the fastest horse in the six brigades of light cavalry, and was only beaten by the Duke of Rovigo's racer from England. As to Charpentier, he had the kind of horse which a horse grenadier or a cuirassier would be likely to ride, a back like a bedstead, you understand, and legs like the posts. He is a hulking fellow himself, so that they look to singular pair. And yet in his insane conceit he ogled the girls as they waved their handkerchiefs to me from the windows, and he twirled his ugly red moustache up into his eyes, just as if it were to him that their attention was addressed. When we came out of the town we passed through the French camp, and then across the battlefield of yesterday, which was still covered both by our own poor fellows and by the Russians. But of the two the camp was the sadder sight. Our army was thawing away. The guards were all right, 
though the young guard was full of conscripts. The artillery and the heavy cavalry were also good if there were more of them, but the infantry privates with them under officers looked like schoolboys with their masters. And we had no reserves. When one considered that there were 80,000 Prussians to the north and 150,000 Russians and Austrians to the south, it might make even the bravest man grave. For my own part, I confess that I shed a tear until the thought came that the Emperor was still with us and that on that very morning he had placed his hand upon my dolmen and had promised me a medal of honour. This set me singing, and I spurred by let on, until Charpentier had to beg me to have mercy on his great, snorting, panting camel. The road was beaten into paste and rutted two feet deep by the artillery so that he was right in saying that it was not the place for a gallop. I have never been very friendly with this charpentier, and now for twenty miles of the way I could not draw a word from him. He rode with his brows puckered and his chin upon his breast, like a man who is heavy with thought. More than once I asked him what was on his mind, thinking that, perhaps, with my quicker intelligence I might set the matter straight. His answer always was that it was his mission of which he was thinking, which surprised me, because, although I had never thought much of his intelligence, Still it seemed to me to be impossible that anyone could be puzzled by so simple and soldierly a task. Well, we came at last to Bazookas, where he was to take the southern road and I the northern. He half turned in his saddle before he left me, and he looked at me with a singular expression of inquiry in his face. What do you make of it, Brigadier? he asked. Of what? Of our mission. Surely it is plain enough. You think so? Why should the Emperor tell us his plans? Because he recognized our intelligence. My companion laughed in a manner which I found annoying. May I ask what you intend to do if you find these villages full of Prussians? He asked. I shall obey my orders. But you will be killed. Very possibly. He laughed again and so offensively that I clapped my hand to my sword. But before I could tell him what I thought of his stupidity and rudeness he had wheeled his horse, and was lumbering away down the other road. I saw his big fur cap vanish over the brow of the hill, and then I rode upon my way, wondering at his conduct. From time to time I put my hand to the breast of my tunic and felt the paper crackle beneath my fingers. Ah, my precious paper, which should be turned into the little silver medal for which I had yearned so long. All the way from brain to surmise I was thinking of what my mother would say when she saw it. I stopped to give Violet a meal at a wayside auberge on the side of a hill not far from Soissons a place surrounded by old oaks, and with so many crows that one could scarce hear one's own voice. It was from the innkeeper that I learned that Marmont had fallen back two days before, and that the Prussians were over the Ain. An hour later, 
In the fading light, I saw two of their wee deaths upon the hill to the right, and then, as darkness gathered, the heavens to the north were all glimmering from the lights of a bivouac. When I heard that Blutcher had been there for two days, I was much surprised that the Empress should not have known that the country through which he had ordered me to carry my precious letter was already occupied by the enemy. Still, I thought of the tone of his voice when he said to Charpentier that a soldier must not choose, but must obey. I should follow the route he had laid down for me as long as Violet could move a hoof or I a finger upon her bridle. All the way from Sermois to Soissons, where the road dips up and down, curving among far woods, I kept my pistol ready and my sword belt braced, pushing on swiftly where the path was straight and then coming slowly round the corners in the way we learned in Spain. When I came to the farmhouse which lies to the right of the road just after you cross the wooden bridge over the craze, near where the great statue of the Virgin stands, a woman cried to me from the field, saying that the Prussians were in Soissons. A small party of their lancers, she said, had come in that very afternoon, and a whole division was expected before midnight. I did not wait to hear the end of her tale, but clapped spurs into Violet, and in five minutes was galloping her into the town. Three alans were at the mouth of the main street, their horses tethered and they gossiping together, each with a pipe as long as my sabre. I saw them well in the light of an open door, but of me they could have seen only the flash of Violet's grey side and the black flutter of my cloak. A moment later I flew through a stream of them rushing from an open gateway. Violet's shoulder sent one of them reeling, and I stabbed at another but missed him. Bang, bang, went two carbines, but I had flown round the curve of the street, and never so much as heard the hiss of the balls. Ah, we were great, both Violet and I. She lay down to it like a coarse hare the fire flying from her hoofs. I stood in my stirrups and brandished my sword. Someone sprang for my bridle. I sliced him through the arm, and I heard him howling behind me. Two horsemen closed upon me. I cut one down and outpaced the other. A minute later I was clear of the town, and flying down a broad white road with the black poplars on either side. For a time I heard the rattle of hoofs behind me, but they died and died until I could not tell them from the throbbing of my own heart. Soon I pulled up and listened, but all was silent. They had given up the chase. Well, the first thing that I did was to dismount and to lead my mare into a small wood through which a stream ran. There I watered her and rubbed her down, giving her two pieces of sugar soaked in cognac from my flask. She was spent from the sharp chase but it was wonderful to see how she came round with a half-hour's rest. When my thighs closed upon her again, I could tell by the spring and the swing of her that it would not be her fault if I did not win my way safe to Paris. I must have been well within the enemy's lines now.
for I heard a number of them shouting one of their rough drinking songs out of a house by the roadside, and I went round by the fields to avoid it. At another time two men came out into the moonlight, for by this time it was a cloudless night, and shouted something in German, but I galloped on without heeding them, and they were afraid to fire, for their own hussars are dressed exactly as I was. It is best to take no notice at these times and then they put you down as a deaf man. It was a lovely moon, and every tree threw a black bar across the road. I could see the countryside just as if it were daytime, and very peaceful it looked, save that there was a great fire raging somewhere in the north. In the silence of the night time, and with the knowledge that danger was in front and behind me, the sight of that great distant fire was very striking and awesome. But I am not easily clouded, for I have seen too many singular things, so I hummed a tune between my teeth and thought of little Lysette, whom I might see in Paris. My mind was full of her when, trotting round a corner, I came straight upon half a dozen German dragoons, who were sitting round a brushwood fire by the roadside. I am an excellent soldier. I do not say this because I am prejudiced in my own favour, but because I really am so. I can weigh every chance in a moment, and decide with as much certainty as though I had brooded for a week. Now I saw like a flash that, come what might, I should be chased, and on a horse which had already done a long twelve leagues. But it was better to be chased onwards than to be chased back. On this moonlit night, with fresh horses behind me, I must take my risk in either case, but if I were to shake them off, I preferred that it should be near Senlis than near Soissons. All this flashed on me as if by instinct, you understand. My eyes had hardly rested on the bearded faces under the brass helmets before my rowels had touched Violet, and she was off with a rattle like a powder charge. Oh, the shouting and rushing and stamping from behind us! Three of them fired and three swung themselves on to their horses. A bullet rapped on the crupper of my saddle with a noise like a stick on a door. Violet sprang madly forward, and I thought she had been wounded, but it was only a graze above the near forfeit lock. Ah, the dear little mare, how I loved her when I felt her settle down into that long, easy gallop of hers her hoofs going like a Spanish girl's castanets. I could not hold myself. I turned on my saddle and shouted and raved, Vive l'impera! I screamed and laughed at the gust of oaths that came back to me. But it was not over yet. If she had been fresh she might have gained a mile in five. Now she could only hold her own with a very little over. There was one of them, a young boy of an officer, who was better mounted than the others. He drew ahead with every stride. Two hundred yards behind him were two troopers. But I saw every time that I glanced round that the distance between them was increasing. The other three who had waited to shoot were a long way in the rear. 
The officer's mount was a bay of fine horse, though not to be spoken of with Violet, yet it was a powerful brute, and it seemed to me that in a few miles its freshness might tell. I waited until the lad was a long way in front of his comrades, and then I eased my mare down a little or very, very little, so that he might think he was really catching me. When he came within pistol shot of me I drew and cocked my own pistol, and laid my chin upon my shoulder to see what he would do. He did not offer to fire, and I soon discerned the cause. The silly boy had taken his pistols from his holsters when he had camped for the night. He wagged his sword at me now and roared some threat or other. He did not seem to understand that he was at my mercy. I eased Violet down until there was not the length of a long lance between the grey tail and the bay muzzle. Ren's vows, he yelled. I must compliment Monsieur upon his French, said I, resting the barrel of my pistol upon my bridle arm, which I have always found best when shooting from the saddle. I aimed at his face, and could see, even in the moonlight, how white he grew when he understood that it was all up with him. But even as my finger pressed the trigger I thought of his mother, and I put my ball through his horse's shoulder. I fear he hurt himself in the fall, for it was a fearful crash. But I had my letter to think of, so I stretched the mare into a gallop once more. But they were not so easily shaken off, these brigands. The two troopers thought no more of their young officer than if he had been a recruit thrown in the riding school. They left him to the others and thundered on after me. I had pulled up on the brow of a hill, thinking that I had heard the last of them, but, my faith, I soon saw there was no time for loitering, so away we went, the mare tossing her head and I my shako, to show what we thought of two dragoons who tried to catch a hussar. But at this moment, even while I laughed at the thought, my heart stood still within me, for there at the end of the long white road was a black patch of cavalry waiting to receive me. To a young soldier it might have seemed the shadow of the trees, but to me it was a troop of hussars, and, turn where I could, death seemed to be waiting for me. Well. I had the dragoons behind me and the hussars in front. Never since Moscow have I seemed to be in such peril. But for the honour of the brigade I had rather be cut down by a light cavalryman than by a heavy. I never drew bridle, therefore, or hesitated for an instant. But I let Violet have her head. I remember that I tried to pray as I rode, but I am a little out of practice at such things, and the only words I could remember were the prayer for fine weather which we used at the school on the evening before holidays. Even this seemed better than nothing, and I was pattering it out when suddenly I heard French voices in front of me, but the joy went through my heart like a musket ball. They were ours our own dear little rascals from the corps of Marmont. Round whisked my two dragoons and galloped for their lives, with the moon gleaming on their brass helmets while I trotted up to my friends with no undue haste.
for I would have them understand that though a Hazar may fly, it is not in his nature to fly very fast. Yet I fear that Violet's heaving flanks and foam's pattered muzzle gave the lie to my careless bearing. Who should be at the head of the troop but old Bouvet, whom I saved at Leipzig? When he saw me, his little pink eyes filled with tears, and, indeed, I could not but shed a few myself at the sight of his joy. I told him of my mission, but he laughed when I said that I must pass through Senlis. The enemy is there, said he. You cannot go. I prefer to go where the enemy is, I answered. But why not go straight to Paris with your dispatch? Why should you choose to pass through the one place where you are almost sure to be taken or killed? A soldier does not choose he obeys, said I, just as I had heard Napoleon say it. Old Bouvet laughed in his wheezy way, until I had to give my moustachios a twirl and look him up and down in a manner which brought him to reason. Well, said he, you had best come along with us, for we are all bound for Senlis. Our orders are to reconnoitre the place. A squadron of Piatkowski's Polish lancers are in front of us. If you must ride through it, it is possible that we may be able to go with you. So away we went, jingling and clanking through the quiet night until we came up with the Poles' fine old soldiers all of them, though a trifle heavy for their horses. It was a treat to see them, for they could not have carried themselves better if they had belonged to my own brigade. We rode together until in the early morning we saw the lights of Senlis. A peasant was coming along with a cart, and from him we learned how things were going there. His information was certain, for his brother was the mayor's coachman, and he had spoken with him late the night before. There was a single squadron of Cossacks or a poke as they call it in their frightful language quartered upon the mayor's house, which stands at the corner of the market place, and is the largest building in the town. A whole division of Prussian infantry was encamped in the woods to the north, but only the Cossacks were in Senlis. Ah, what a chance to avenge ourselves upon these barbarians! whose cruelty to our poor country folk was the talk at every camp fire. We were into the town like a torrent, hacked down the vedettes, rode over the guard, and were smashing in the doors of the mayor's house before they understood that there was a Frenchman within twenty miles of them. We saw horrid heads at the windows heads peered to the temples, with tangled hair and sheepskin caps, and silly, gaping mouths. They shrieked, and fired with their carbines, but our fellows were into the house and at their throats before they had wiped the sleep out of their eyes. It was dreadful to see how the Poles flung themselves upon them like starving wolves upon a herd of fat bucks for, as you know, the Poles have a blood feud against the Cossacks. The most were killed in the upper rooms, whither they had fled for shelter, and the blood was pouring down into the hall like rain from a roof. They are terrible soldiers, these Poles though I think they are a trifle heavy for their horses. 
man for man, they are as big as Kellerman's cuirassiers. Their equipment is, of course, much lighter, since they are without the cuirass, backplate, and helmet. Well, it was at this point that I made an error, a very serious error, it must be admitted. Up to this moment I had carried out my mission in a manner which only my modesty prevents me from describing as remarkable. But now I did that which an official would condemn and a soldier excuse. There is no doubt that the mayor was spent, but still it is true that I might have galloped on through Senlis and reached the country, where I should have had no enemy between me and Paris. But what hussar can ride past to fight and never draw rein? It is to ask too much of him. Besides, I thought that if Violet had an hour of rest, I might have three hours the better at the other end. Then on the top of it came those heads at the windows, with their sheepskin hats and their barbarous cries. I sprang from my saddle, threw Violet's bridle over a rail post, and ran into the house with the rest. It is true that I was too late to be of service, and that I was nearly wounded by a lance thrust from one of these dying savages. Still, it is a pity to miss even the smallest affair, for one never knows what opportunity for advancement may present itself. I have seen more soldierly work in outpost skirmishes and little gallop and hack affairs of the kind than in any of the emperor's big battles. When the house was cleared, I took a bucket of water out for Violet, and our peasant guide showed me where the good mayor kept his fodder. My faith! but the little sweetheart was ready for it. Then I sponged down her legs, and leaving her still tethered I went back into the house to find a mouthful for myself, so that I should not need to halt again until I was in Paris. And now I come to the part of my story which may seem singular to you, although I could tell you at least ten things every bit as queer which have happened to me in my lifetime. You can understand that, to a man who spends his life in scouting and v dead duties on the bloody ground which lies between two great armies, there are many chances of strange experiences. I'll tell you, however, Exactly what occurred. Old Bouvet was waiting in the passage when I entered, and he asked me whether we might not crack a bottle of wine together. My faith, we must not be long, said he. There are ten thousand of Thilman's Prussians in the woods up yonder. Where is the wine? I asked. Ah, you may trust two hussars to find where the wine is, said he, and taking a candle in his hand, he led the way down the stone stairs into the kitchen. When we got there, we found another door, which opened on to a winding stair with the cellar at the bottom. The Cossacks had been there before us as was easily seen by the broken bottles littered all over it. However, the mayor was a bon vivant, and I do not wish to have a better set of bins to pick from. Chamberton, Graves, elegant, white wine and red, sparkling and still, they lay in pyramids peeping coyly out of sawdust. 
Old Bouvet stood with his candle looking here and peeping there, purring in his throat like a cat before a milk pail. He had picked upon a burgundy at last, and had his hand outstretched to the bottle when there came a roar of musketry from above us, a rush of feet, and such a yelping and screaming as I have never listened to. The Prussians were upon us. Bouvet is a brave man, I will say that for him. He flashed out his sword and away he clattered up the stone steps, his spurs clinking as he ran. I followed him, but just as we came out into the kitchen passage a tremendous shout told us that the house had been recaptured. It is all over, I cried, grasping at Bouvet's sleeve. There is one more to die, he shouted, and away he went like a madman up the second stair. In effect, I should have gone to my death also had I been in his place, for he had done very wrong in not throwing out his scouts to warn him if the Germans advanced upon him. For an instant I was about to rush up with him. And then I bethought myself that, after all, I had my own mission to think of, and that if I were taken the important letter of the Emperor would be sacrificed. I let Bouvet die alone, therefore, and I went down into the cellar again, closing the door behind me. Well, it was not a very rosy prospect down there either. Bouvet had dropped the candle when the alarm came, and I, pawing about in the darkness, could find nothing but broken bottles. At last I came upon the candle, which had rolled under the curve of a cask, but, try as I would with my tinder box, I could not light it. The reason was that the wick had been wet in a puddle of wine, so suspecting that this might be the case, I cut the end off with my sword. Then I found that it lighted easily enough. But what to do I could not imagine. The scoundrels upstairs were shouting themselves hoarse, several hundred of them from the sound and it was clear that some of them would soon want to moisten their throats. There would be an end to a dashing soldier, and of the mission and of the medal. I thought of my mother and I thought of the emperor. It made me weep to think that the one would lose so excellent a son and the other the best light cavalry officer he ever had since Lazel's time. But presently I dashed the tears from my eyes. Courage! I cried, striking myself upon the chest. Courage, my brave boy! Is it possible that one who has come safely from Moscow without so much as a frostbite will die in a French wine cellar? At the thought I was up on my feet and clutching at the letter in my tunic, for the crackle of it gave me courage. My first plan was to set fire to the house, in the hope of escaping in the confusion. My second to get into an empty wine cask. I was looking round to see if I could find one, when suddenly, in the corner, I espied a little low door, painted of the same grey colour as the wall, so that it was only a man with quick sight who would have noticed it. I pushed against it, and at first I imagined that it was locked. Presently, however, it gave a little, 
and then I understood that it was held by the pressure of something on the other side. I put my feet against a hog's head of wine, and I gave such a push that the door flew open and I came down with a crash upon my back, the candle flying out of my hands, so that I found myself in darkness once more. I picked myself up and stared through the black archway into the gloom beyond. There was a slight ray of light coming from some slit or grating. The dawn had broken outside, and I could dimly see the long, curving sides of several huge casks, which made me think that perhaps this was where the mayor kept his reserves of wine while they were maturing. At any rate, it seemed to be a safer hiding place than the outer cellar, so gathering up my candle, I was just closing the door behind me, when I suddenly saw something which filled me with amazement, and even, I confess, with the smallest little touch of fear. I have said that at the further end of the cellar there was a dim grey fan of light striking downwards from somewhere near the roof. Well, as I peered through the darkness, I suddenly saw a great, tall man skip into this belt of daylight, and then out again into the darkness at the further end. My word, I gave such a start that my shako nearly broke its chin strap. It was only a glance, but, nonetheless, I had time to see that the fellow had a hairy corset cap on his head, and that he was a great, long-legged, broad-shouldered brigand, with a saber at his waist. My faith. Even Ishine Gerard was a little staggered at being left alone with such a creature in the dark. But only for a moment. Courage. I thought. Am I not a hussar, a brigadier, too, at the age of thirty-one, and the chosen messenger of the emperor? After all, this skulker had more cause to be afraid of me than I of him. And then suddenly I understood that he was afraid, horribly afraid. I could read it from his quick step and his bent shoulders as he ran among the barrels, like a rat making for its hole. And, of course, it must have been he who had held the door against me, and not some packing case or a wine cask as I had imagined. He was the pursued then, and I the pursuer. Aha! I felt my whiskers bristle as I advanced upon him through the darkness. He would find that he had no chicken to deal with this robber from the north. For the moment I was magnificent. At first I had feared to light my candle lest I should make a mark of myself, but now, after cracking my shin over a box, and catching my spurs in some canvas, I thought the bolder course the wiser. I lit it, therefore, and then I advanced with long strides, my sword in my hand. Come out, you rascal! I cried. Nothing can save you. You will at last meet with your deserts. I held my candle high, and presently I caught a glimpse of the man's head staring at me over a barrel. He had a gold chevron on his black cap, and the expression of his face told me in an instant that he was an officer and a man of refinement. Monsieur, he cried, 
in excellent French, I surrender myself on a promise of quarter. But if I do not have your promise, I will then sell my life as dearly as I can. Sir, said I, a Frenchman knows how to treat an unfortunate enemy. Your life is safe. With that he handed his sword over the top of the barrel, and I bowed with the candle on my heart. Whom have I the honor of capturing? I asked. I am the Count Boutkine, of the Emperor's own Don Cossacks, said he. I came out with my troop to reconnoitre Senlis, and as we found no sign of your people we determined to spend the night here. And would it be an indiscretion, I asked. If I were to inquire how you came into the back cellar. Nothing simpler, said he. It was our intention to start at early dawn. Feeling chilled after dressing, I thought that a cup of wine would do me no harm, so I came down to see what I could find. As I was rummaging about, the house was suddenly carried by assault so rapidly that by the time I had climbed the stairs it was all over. It only remained for me to save myself, so I came down here and hid myself in the back cellar, where you have found me. I thought of how old Bouvet had behaved under the same conditions and the tears sprang to my eyes as I contemplated the glory of France. Then I had to consider what I should do next. It was clear that this Russian count, being in the back cellar while we were in the front one, had not heard the sounds which would have told him that the house was once again in the hands of his own allies. If he should once understand this the tables would be turned, and I should be his prisoner instead of he being mine. What was I to do? I was at my wit's end, when suddenly there came to me an idea so brilliant that I could not but be amazed at my own invention. Count Boutkine, said I. I find myself in a most difficult position. And why? he asked. Because I have promised you your life. His jaw dropped a little. You would not withdraw your promise, he cried. If the worst comes to the worst, I can die in your defense, said I but the difficulties are great. What is it, then? he asked. I will be frank with you, said I. You must know that our fellows, and especially the Poles, are so incensed against the Cossacks that the mere sight of the uniform drives them mad. They precipitate themselves instantly upon the wearer and tear him limb from limb. Even their officers cannot restrain them. The Russian grew pale at my words and the way in which I said them. But this is terrible, said he. Horrible, said I. If we were to go up together at this moment, I cannot promise how far I could protect you. I am in your hands, he cried. What would you suggest that we should do? Would it not be best that I should remain here? That worst of all. And why? Because our fellows will ransack the house presently, and then you would be cut to pieces. No, no, 
I must go and break it to them. But even then, when once they see that accursed uniform, I do not know what may happen. Should I then take the uniform off? Excellent. I cried. Hold, we have it. You will take your uniform off and put on mine. That will make you sacred to every French soldier. It is not the French I fear so much as the Poles. But my uniform will be a safeguard against either. How can I thank you? He cried. But you what are you to wear? I will wear yours. And perhaps fall a victim to your generosity? It is my duty to take the risk, I answered, but I have no fears. I will ascend in your uniform. A hundred swords will be turned upon me. Hold. I will shout, I am the Brigadier Gerard. Then they will see my face. They will know me. And I will tell them about you. Under the shield of these clothes you will be sacred. His fingers trembled with eagerness as he tore off his tunic. His boots and breeches were much like my own, so there was no need to change them, but I gave him my hussar jacket, my dolman, my shackle, my sword belt, and my sabre dash, while I took in exchange his high sheepskin cap with the gold chevron, his fur-trimmed coat, and his crooked sword. Be it well understood that in changing the tunics I did not forget to change my thrice precious letter also from my old one to my new. With your leave, said I, I shall now bind you to a barrel. He made a great fuss over this, but I have learned in my soldiering never to throw away chances, and how could I tell that he might not? when my back was turned, see how the matter really stood, and break in upon my plans. He was leaning against a barrel at the time, so I ran six times round it with a rope, and then tied it with a big knot behind. If he wished to come upstairs he would, at least, have to carry a thousand litres of good French wine for a knapsack. I then shut the door of the back cellar behind me, so that he might not hear what was going forward, and tossing the candle away I ascended the kitchen stair. There were only about twenty steps, and yet, while I came up them, I seemed to have time to think of everything that I had ever hoped to do. It was the same feeling that I had at Tilau when I lay with my broken leg and saw the horse artillery galloping down upon me. Of course, I knew that if I were taken I should be shot instantly as being disguised within the enemy's lines. Still, it was a glorious death in the direct service of the Emperor and I reflected that there could not be less than five lines, and perhaps seven, in the monitor about me. Palerit had eight lines, and I am sure that he had not so fine a career. When I made my way out into the hall, with all the nonchalance in my face and manner that I could assume, the very first thing that I saw was Bouvet's dead body, with his legs drawn up and a broken sword in his hand. I could see by the black smudge that he had been shot at close quarters. I should have wished to salute as I went by, for he was a gallant man, 
but I feared lest I should be seen, and so I passed on. The front of the hall was full of Prussian infantry, who were knocking loopholes in the wall, as though they expected that there might be yet another attack. Their officer, a little man, was running about giving directions. They were all too busy to take much notice of me, but another officer, who was standing by the door with a long pipe in his mouth, strode across and clapped me on the shoulder, pointing to the dead bodies of our poor hussars, and saying something which was meant for a jest, for his long beard opened and showed every fang in his head. I laughed heartily also, and said the only Russian words that I knew. I learned them from little Sophie, at Wilna, and they meant, if the night is fine we shall meet under the oak tree, but if it rains we shall meet in the byre. It was all the same to this German, however and I have no doubt that he gave me credit for saying something very witty indeed, for he roared laughing, and slapped me on my shoulder again. I nodded to him and marched out of the hall door as coolly as if I were the commandant of the garrison. There were a hundred horses tethered about outside most of them belonging to the Poles and Hussars. Good little Violet was waiting with the others, and she whinnied when she saw me coming towards her. But I would not mount her. Number I was much too cunning for that. On the contrary, I chose the most shaggy little Cossack horse that I could see, and I sprang upon it with as much assurance as though it had belonged to my father before me. It had a great bag of plunder slung over its neck, and this I laid upon Violet's back, and led her along beside me. Never have you seen such a picture of the Cossack returning from the foray. It was superb. Well, the town was full of Prussians by this time. They lined the sidewalks and pointed me out to each other, saying, as I could judge from their gestures, there goes one of those devils of Cossacks. They are the boys for foraging and plunder. One or two officers spoke to me with an air of authority, but I shook my head and smiled, and said, If the night is fine we shall meet under the oak tree, but if it rains we shall meet in the byre, at which they shrugged their shoulders and gave the matter up. In this way I worked along until I was beyond the northern outskirt of the town. I could see in the roadway two Lancer Vedettes with their black and white pennants, and I knew that when I was once past these I should be a free man once more. I made my pony trot, therefore, Violet rubbing her nose against my knee all the time and looking up at me to ask how she had deserved that this hairy doormat of a creature should be preferred to her. I was not more than a hundred yards from the Alans when, suddenly, you can imagine my feelings when I saw a real Cossack coming galloping along the road towards me. Ah, my friend, you who read this, if you have any heart, you will feel for a man like me, who had gone through so many dangers and trials, only at this very last moment to be confronted with one which appeared to put an end to everything. I will confess that for a moment I lost heart, 
and was inclined to throw myself down in my despair, and to cry out that I had been betrayed. But, no, I was not beaten even now. I opened two buttons of my tunic so that I might get easily at the Emperor's message, for it was my fixed determination when all hope was gone to swallow the letter and then die sword in hand. Then I felt that my little, crooked sword was loose in its sheath, and I trotted on to where the Vedettes were waiting. They seemed inclined to stop me, but I pointed to the other Cossack, who was still a couple of hundred yards off, and they, understanding that I merely wished to meet him, let me pass with a salute. I dug my spurs into my pony then, for if I were only far enough from the lancers I thought I might manage the Cossack without much difficulty. He was an officer, a large, bearded man, with a gold chevron in his cap, just the same as mine. As I advanced he unconsciously aided me by pulling up his horse, so that I had a fine start of the videttes. On I came for him, and I could see wonder changing to suspicion in his brown eyes as he looked at me and at my pony, and at my equipment. I do not know what it was that was wrong, but he saw something which was as it should not be. He shouted out a question, and then when I gave no answer he pulled out his sword. I was glad in my heart to see him do so for I had always rather fight than cut down an unsuspecting enemy. Now I made at him full tilt, and, parrying his cut, I got my point in just under the fourth button of his tunic. Down he went, and the weight of him nearly took me off my horse before I could disengage. I never glanced at him to see if he were living or dead, for I sprang off my pony and on to Violet, with a shake of my bridle and a kiss of my hand to the two Lands behind me. They galloped after me, shouting, but Violet had had her rest, and was just as fresh as when she started. I took the first side road to the west and then the first to the south, which would take me away from the enemy's country. On we went and on, every stride taking me further from my foes and nearer to my friends. At last, when I reached the end of a long stretch of road, and looking back from it could see no sign of any pursuers, I understood that my troubles were over. And it gave me a glow of happiness, as I rode, to think that I had done to the letter what the Emperor had ordered. What would he say when he saw me? What could he say which would do justice to the incredible way in which I had risen above every danger? He had ordered me to go through Sermois, Soissons, and Senlis, little dreaming that they were all three occupied by the enemy. And yet I had done it. I had borne his letter in safety through each of these towns. Khazars, Dragoons, Lancers, Cossacks and infantry I had run the gauntlet of all of them, and had come out unharmed. When I had got as far as Damerton I caught a first glimpse of our own outposts. There was a troop of dragoons in a field, and of course I could see from the horsehair crests that they were French. 
I galloped towards them in order to ask them if all was safe between there and Paris, and as I rode I felt such a pride at having won my way back to my friends again, that I could not refrain from waving my sword in the air. At this a young officer galloped out from among the dragoons, also brandishing his sword, and it warmed my heart to think that he should come riding with such ardor and enthusiasm to greet me. I made Violet Caracol, and as we came together I brandished my sword more gallantly than ever but you can imagine my feelings when he suddenly made a cut at me which would certainly have taken my head off if I had not fallen forward with my nose in Violet's mane. My faith, it whistled just over my cap like an east wind. Of course, it came from this accursed Cossack uniform which, in my excitement, I had forgotten all about, and this young dragoon had imagined that I was some Russian champion who was challenging the French cavalry. My word, he was a frightened man when he understood how near he had been to killing the celebrated Brigadier Gerard. Well, the road was clear and about three o'clock in the afternoon I was at St. Denis, though it took me a long two hours to get from there to Paris, for the road was blocked with commissariat wagons and guns of the artillery reserve, which was going north to Marmont and Mortier. You cannot conceive the excitement which my appearance in such a costume made in Paris, and when I came to the Rue de Rivoli I should think I had a quarter of a mile of folk riding or running behind me. Word had got about from the dragoons, two of whom had come with me, and everybody knew about my adventures and how I had come by my uniform. It was a triumph man shouting and women waving their handkerchiefs and blowing kisses from the windows. Although I am a man singularly free from conceit, still I must confess that, on this one occasion, I could not restrain myself from showing that this reception gratified me. The Russian's coat had hung very loose upon me, but now I threw out my chest until it was as tight as a sausage skin. And my little sweetheart of a mare tossed her mane and poured with her front hoofs, frisking her tail about as though she said, We've done it together this time. It is to us that commissions should be entrusted. When I kissed her between the nostrils as I dismounted at the gate of the Tuileries, there was as much shouting as if a bulletin had been read from the Grand Army. I was hardly in costume to visit a king, but, after all, if one has a soldierly figure one can do without all that. I was shown up straight away to Joseph whom I had often seen in Spain. He seemed as stout, as quiet, and as amiable as ever. Tolly Rand was in the room with him, or I suppose I should call him the Duke of Pimento, but I confess that I like old names best. He read my letter when Joseph Bonaparte handed it to him, and then he looked at me with the strangest expression in those funny little, twinkling eyes of his. Were you the only messenger? he asked. There was one other, sir, said I, Major Charpentier, of the Horse Grenadiers. He has not yet arrived, said the King of Spain. 
If you had seen the legs of his horse, sire, you would not wonder at it, I remarked. There may be other reasons, said Tolerand, and he gave that singular smile of his. Well, they paid me a compliment or two, though they might have said a good deal more and yet have said too little. I bowed myself out, and very glad I was to get away, for I hate to court as much as I love a camp. Away I went to my old friend Schubert, in the room Rumsnil, and there I got his Hassa uniform, which fitted me very well. He and Lyset and I supped together in his rooms, and all my dangers were forgotten. In the morning I found Violet ready for another twenty-league stretch. It was my intention to return instantly to the Emperor's headquarters, for I was, as you may well imagine, impatient to hear his words of praise, and to receive my reward. I need not say that I rode back by a safe route for I had seen quite enough of Alans and Cossacks. I passed through Mx and Chateau Thierry, and so in the evening I arrived at Reims, where Napoleon was still lying. The bodies of our fellows and of Vesti Prest's Russians had all been buried, and I could see changes in the camp also. The soldiers looked better cared for, some of the cavalry had received remounts, and everything was in excellent order. It was wonderful what a good general can effect in a couple of days. When I came to the headquarters, I was shown straight into the emperor's room. He was drinking coffee at a writing table with a big plan drawn out on paper in front of him. Berthia and MacDonald were leaning, one over each shoulder, and he was talking so quickly that I don't believe that either of them could catch a half of what he was saying. But when his eyes fell upon me he dropped the pen onto the chart and he sprang up with a look in his pale face which struck me cold. What the deuce are you doing here? he shouted. When he was angry he had a voice like a peacock. I have the honor to report to you, sire, said I, that I have delivered your dispatch safely to the king of Spain. What? He yelled, and his two eyes transfixed me like bayonets. Oh, those dreadful eyes, shifting from grey to blue, like steel in the sunshine. I can see them now when I have a bad dream. What has become of Charpentier? he asked. He is captured, said MacDonald. By whom? The Russians. The Cossacks? No, a single Cossack. He gave himself up? Without resistance. He is an intelligent officer. You will see that the Medal of Honor is awarded to him. When I heard those words I had to rub my eyes to make sure that I was awake. As to you, cried the emperor, taking a step forward as if he would have struck me, you brain of a hare, what do you think that you were sent upon this mission for? Do you conceive that I would send a really important message by such a hand as yours? and through every village which the enemy holds? How you came through them passes my comprehension, 
but if your fellow messenger had had but as little sense as you, my whole plan of campaign would have been ruined. Can you not see, Coglian, that this message contained false news, and that it was intended to deceive the enemy whilst I put a very different scheme into execution? When I heard those cruel words and saw the angry, white face which glared at me, I had to hold the back of a chair, for my mind was failing me and my knees would hardly bear me up. But then I took courage as I reflected that I was an honourable gentleman, and that my whole life had been spent in toiling for this man and for my beloved country. Sire, said I, and the tears would trickle down my cheeks whilst I spoke, when you are dealing with a man like me you would find it wiser to deal openly. Had I known that you had wished the dispatch to fall into the hands of the enemy, I would have seen that it came there. As I believed that I was to guard it. I was prepared to sacrifice my life for it. I do not believe, sire, that any man in the world ever met with more toils and perils than I have done in trying to carry out what I thought was your will. I dashed the tears from my eyes as I spoke and with such fire and spirit as I could command I gave him an account of it all, of my dash through Soissons, my brush with the dragoons, my adventure in Senlis, my rencontre with Count Boutkine in the cellar, my disguise, my meeting with the Cossack officer, my flight and how at the last moment I was nearly cut down by a French dragoon. The Emperor, Berthier, and MacDonald listened with astonishment on their faces. When I had finished Napoleon stepped forward and he pinched me by the ear. There, there, said he. Forget anything which I may have said. I would have done better to trust you. You may go. I turned to the door, and my hand was upon the handle, when the Emperor called upon me to stop. You will see, said he, turning to the Duke of Tarentum, that Brigadier Gerard has the special medal of honour for I believe that if he has the thickest head he has also the stoutest heart in my army.